I'm gonna record it, but may as well. <laughs> so. I'll just wait one more minute. So, <clears throat> did you do anything last week with this class? <laughs> when does Daniela show up, Frank? Yeah, but there was an announcement that it wasn't a lecture last week. Just work on your own. Yeah, yeah. But um, have you looked at the exercises? Okay. Yes, I get started. Uh, do you still have the paper we will lack some dates? Uh, which which paper? Uh, the paper we had to go around where everyone wrote on their dates of exams. Yes, I still have that. Um, this one. That's one thing I needed to talk about. Did you see my email? Yeah, sure. Okay. Good idea. Is there anyone that you know that's not on this list? <coughs> I think everybody who attends this class is on the list. It's on this list. Yeah, uh, okay. we like nine, oh, seven, seven, eighteen people. Oh, no. no. we just gonna log into front row and look. Uh, yeah, I saw the list on front row. And I took the email addresses from front row, and I sent the email to everybody on the map. Twenty-seven. Yes. Uh, what did you write? Twenty-fifth. Twenty-fifth. Okay. That's good. So is it better to have it a little bit earlier rather than later? Yeah. Because um, you know everybody has exams on that week that's after. So I thought maybe the 25th would be, because you're done with classes, we just don't have anybody that gotten into the exams yet. Um, better earlier than later, yeah. yeah. Bigger Christmas vacation. Oh, it's going to be the slow to remain bad at all. Um, we were just talking about the exam, and uh, I sent an email around to everybody to say that um, I suggest the 25th of November as the exam date. Does anyone have a problem with that that's here today? Because uh, I did send an email, but nobody responded. So, okay. Then I'll go to study administration and I'll ask them about changing the date to that date. And then there should be something on the list that they produce which shows the new date when it gets registered. <coughs> okay. Um, so we will go through the two chapters today. If we happen to get done early, we'll stop early because I have a throat problem and uh, it doesn't help to just keep going with this. Uh, I made additional uh, transparencies. These are in addition to the ones that are already up on the website. And I will put these up as well. I just usually like to go through them first. And then if there's any changes, then I'll put them up after the, after the lecture. So today we're talking about uh, chapters five and six, organization systems and labeling systems. Um, first of all, uh, the organization of information is uh, something that's been going on for a long time and uh, it's done differently in different fields. In, in the library and information science they have been using the SORI and indexing. There's card catalog systems. If you've gone up to the library you've seen that they've used certain techniques for uh, labeling and organizing uh, where the information is located. And the uh, different uh, disciplines have had different types of uh, approaches to this. Um, but there's a lot of challenges with organizing information. Uh, the book list, uh, these, we'll have some other slides that go into these in more depth. We've had uh, 
significant amount of information growth, especially with the uh, internet and, and the web. And uh, so this information is not only uh, available, what was created centrally, but also now there's a greater information uh, content that end users are contributing to. Uh, ambiguity, and we'll, we'll go into what uh, this means. Uh, heterogeneity, when, uh, the, um, this is about what is the type of information that we're looking for. When you go to a library, you might get a book out of the um, out of the library, and the library might maintain books and uh, journals or magazines and so forth. But usually, there's a certain uh, size of the information that is uh, accessible, and you know how to search for that type of size of information. Uh, when you have websites, you can have information can be presented in all types of ways. It can be can, it can be presented as a holistic document, or it could be a record from a database, which is a piece of information from a large volume of data. So having to deal with these different types of uh, sizes of data and formats of data is more challenging than you would have in a, in a physical sense. Uh, the difference in perspective, um, you should realize that not everybody that is looking at the information sees it from the same perspective. And it might, the information might mean something completely different to someone with different knowledge background. So if you're presenting art on a website, it would mean something different to an artist than it would be to a lay person that's not trained in art, for example. Uh, internal politics, uh, This, uh, what the book says is that when you're creating a website or organization of information, you should consider the organization that you're preparing it for and that there is always going to be a politic within an organization and this will influence the type of labels and organization system that you come up with. Uh, this goes back to the, do we have two slides on the initial two bullet points, information growth and ambiguity. Uh, this shows that um, the volume of information is increasing exponentially and that the content uh, of organization uh, is uh, changing also. So we have uh, Syrian king, kings organized tablets by subject and there may be one or too many tablets. You have information architecture, uh, architects arrive, and they're used to help organize the content of the web. In between, we have things like organizing books in libraries, Dewey Decimal System, and other types of bi bibliographic uh, organizational systems. Uh, the point on ambiguity is that uh, different, uh, for the most part, the information we access, we use a lot of language. Language of itself is ambiguous. And that uh, we need uh, to be able to decide who our audience is so that we understand how they're going to interpret the information. So the word pitch, for example, has a lot of different meanings. If uh, you say pitch in the US, they might think about throwing a baseball, for example. If you say pitch in the UK, they might think of it as some sort of a field for playing, I guess it's rugby, I'm not really sure even what it is, which field, but it has different meanings. If you say it's also, it's a substance for waterproofing. It's also the stern rising and falling of the boat of the bow and stern of a ship. So when it's going up and down like this. Uh, it's when a salesman tries to sell you something, they give you a pitch, they pitch their product. So you can see that simply using a word like pitch may not be a good enough solution for a labeling system, for example. Okay. So 
Uh, when we're organizing websites, uh, organization systems consist of two types of organization. They're schemes and structures. Organization is connected to navigation and labeling and indexing. So all of these things are tightly uh, connected to each other. Usually the, the organization system, you will see the navigational structure and the labeling structure and the indexing structure within your organization, within the website. Uh, so, uh, but we can think about uh, organization separately because this will maybe help us produce a better navigation system or a better labeling system. Okay, so the book talks about different types of organization schemes. Um, so if you're looking at chapter 5, which begins on page, um, let me see, it's in the 70s. Okay. Okay, um, uh, I haven't put in all of the figures for all the different types of schemes, but uh, if you look on page 60, yeah, 60, uh, there is an example of an alphabetical organizational scheme as a directory of people that work at Microsoft Research. And the way you would look up people is maybe by their last name, and this is alphabetical. Another kind of organizational scheme would be chronological. The uh, picture of this is on page 61 in the book. Uh, in the chronological scheme, you might have things that are uh, most recent at the top, for example, and things that are older at the bottom. If you go to the website fin.no, they will have maybe listings of properties, and they have a, a section on properties, item, and they list, can list uh, things different ways. So you can choose the listing that you want to use, but they might, you might list things from the newest postings at the top, and then the oldest ones on the next, at the bottom, or at the following pages. So that's chronological. Another way of listing things is geographical. And again, if you're looking at, for example, the uh, fin.no and the listing of properties, uh, you will not just look at all of the properties all over the country, but you will go down to the area that you're interested in. And so this is a, a labeling scheme that uses geographical information. And then on page 62 is a picture of the geographical organizational scheme. Um, yeah. okay. uh, there's different types of organizational schemes. There's, and the other ones, these were called exact schemes because you actually know what you're looking for. And so you kind of, uh, you search for that particular uh, category of what you're looking for, either the person's name or the date or the location, for example. But another type of organization scheme is inexact. And in the inexact organization schemes, you have um, uh, the, the scheme is supposed to support the serendipitous mode of information seeking. That means when you don't exactly know what you're looking for. And it's harder uh, to create these schemes, but they can be more useful in helping the end user find what they're looking for. So uh, you can do this by topic or task, and or you can do it by audience. So if we see, again, I haven't put in the pictures. Um, on page uh, 63, uh, there's a topical taxonomy and it shows categories and subcategories. So if you're looking for a, a car, you might be looking for, it's, it's about consumerreports.org. And so there has, there's a section that's about cars or uh, appliances or electronics and computers, things like that. These are different topics. Uh, and then 
Uh, you could also search on task and or organize the scheme on task. And uh, this might be like the example they give is eBay, uh, where you're trying to uh, shop for something. So in eBay, you might be looking up, uh, they have labels such as uh, buying and selling and help. Uh, but usually if you go into this uh, tag on buying, there might be different steps in the buying process that you have to go through. So there's an organization around what you actually do are doing. And then there can be uh, an organization scheme based on audience. So you have uh, the example of Dell computers, and that's on page 65. Uh, the Dell uh, invites users to self-identify. So they try to split up whether you're a small home individual buyer, if you're part of a small business, if you're part of a large business. It will direct you to different parts of their information base and different parts of their product base. So that's depending on who you are. Um, if you have uh, some sort of a searching tool, you could look up, for example, any bank site. So pick a bank so that you use and look up the website of the bank. Nobody's moving. Everybody look up a bank <laughs> on, on, your, on your phone or your, or your computer. I know you have some. <laughs> you don't have anything? Old phone, just for calling. Okay, sit next to him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, what then? Okay, uh, what kind of uh, scheme do they use? Do they use, can you find an example of topic, task, and audience? Oh, yeah. Task or are like different audience. topics in yeah. the scroll down menu panel? Okay, but uh, what kind of you say they separate by uh, tasks. What kind of tasks do they have? Tasks. Yeah, like uh, loans, savings, insurance. Okay. Accounts overview. Okay. So you wouldn't consider that to be topics? Or is it something they actually have to do? Give me a second here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Tasks are in the in the uh oh, so Don't think so. But is there any separation of audience? Um, yeah. They have like private, they've got business, mm. which would be uh, two separate uh, yes. audiences. That's the most typical separation for banks. They seem to separate the audience between private and business users. Whereas like in the, the example of Dell, they divided people by private and then different kinds of businesses, like small business and big businesses. Okay. Okay. But anyway. <coughs> um, yeah. So it is possible to use these separations. You can also use different kinds of uh, schemes like uh, metaphors. And the metaphor we are used to are things like desktop, folders, files, trash cans. These are on our, our computing devices. And uh, of course, they're not. They're, they're a metaphor for the physical world, where we used to have desktops and folders and files and trash cans over there. So, but these kind of metaphors tend to break down, or uh, they don't they don't really uh, go so far as to be very specific. And then hybrids are common but uh, troublesome, and that means that. Uh, if you try to put everything together, you have to be careful about how you do that. Here's an example of a hybrid scheme, and it's not very easy to navigate through this because if you have things like adult, art and humanities, community center, uh, get a card from a library, you don't understand the contextual structure of this site. Where am I supposed to be looking? 
because they have audience-oriented, topical-oriented, metaphor-based-oriented, functional-oriented. Uh, this is task functional, and uh, so uh, it's not it's not uh, easy to uh, find where you're going. And then, but they said the exception is that you can use different kinds of schemes, but you should use them at the top navigational layer, and you should put them in groupings. So if you're going to have a menu with audience oriented, you should have that kind of sectioned off together. So you have adult children next to each other. And then if you have things like topical, maybe there's different topics that are underneath on a different menu bar that have to do with uh, topics like direction humanities, science, social sciences. So if you're a student, uh, you can go in and uh, look at what kind of uh, programs exist, for example. Okay, so uh, try to group your hybrid schemes at the top level of navigation. Um, so those are different types of schemes. And then if you look at the organizational structures, there's different ways of um, that the user can navigate. Uh, one, the most common structures we see are hierarchies. Uh, hierarchies are a top-down approach or taxonomy, and there's different types of trade-offs such as narrow and deep versus broad and shallow. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but I want to point out the other types of. Uh, navigate uh, the other types of structures. There's a database structure where you work from the bottom up and this is making use of things like metadata for uh, searching and browsing. Uh, the book gives an example of a Rolodex as an example of a bottom-up approach and it's limited to searching for each card by last name. Does anybody know what a Rolodex is? Have you ever seen Rolodex? <laughs> yes. Uh, it's, it's people's, like usually you'd have them in offices before you had like electronic databases. Uh, you put the person's name and their telephone number and maybe where they work on a card. And you put the card in a slot and the slot was on a pole and you could spin this around. So you could go in alphabetical order looking up your contacts. It's like putting, a, if you had a bunch of business cards all on, uh, on a reel, and you could go around and look for them, and then uh, you pick out the one you need, you look up the telephone number, you call the person. So this is what we did back in the way back time, uh, before we had uh, databases online. But uh, databases are, uh, they use a similar kind of idea. They use uh, keywords or primary keys as uh, ways of accessing the information. And the information is organized uh, in different types of records and fields. And we have di different ways of accessing this, usually through a relational database uh, scheme. So the metadata is the primary key that links information architecture to the design of a database schema. And tagging documents and other information objects with controlled vocabulary metadata, we enable powerful searching, browsing, filtering, and, the, and dynamic linking. So you can see that uh, this is a very powerful way of accessing information from the bottom up but it works best on certain types of information. Like when we were talking about searching for exact information, information we know what we're looking for. It's a little bit harder to make use of this when you have this uh, ambiguous data. So usually th there's a combination of systems that are used. You might use one layer a hierarchy and at another layer you might use a metadata for more uh, so subsets of information. And then um, 
that there's also hypertext, but hypertext is not useful as a primary organizational structure. Hypertext allows us to make associations between information and go from one set of information to another, but it doesn't really, it's not primarily used as an organizational structure. We will explain why. Uh, still continuing on the database model, we have information architects need to understand how metadata, control vocabularies, and database structures can be used to enable the automatic generation of alphabetical indexes, such as product indexes, uh, dynamic presentation of the associative, see also links, fielded searching, uh, advanced filtering, and sorting of search results. So this is what uh, we make use of metadata and control vocabularies to be able to access information, creating indices and searching and accessing information. Database models are useful when applied to relatively homogeneous sub-sites. And they took about, not the whole site, but they took about certain sub subsets of information, subsites. He used the word subtypes, and such as product catalogs and staff directories. So it's good on known uh, sets of information when we know what we're looking for. However, enterprise control vocabularies can also provide thin horizontal uh, layer of structure across the full breadth of the site. And then deeper vertical vocabularies can then be created for particular uh, departments, subjects, or audiences. So you can also use things uh, like searches to find general information across the site, and then use different types of searches to deep, deep deeper within a certain um, database. Okay, uh, so the databases were um, more bottom up, and the hierarchical organization is top-down. Why do we use hierarchies? Um, okay, so um, we use hierarchies because there's usually some sort of natural way of grouping things and uh, they're very familiar to us. We see hi hierarchies all the time. There's hierarchies in, in workplace. Uh, there's hierarchies in the natural world uh, and it allows us to deal with uh, grouping objects and, and we can manage because our cognitive limitations allow us to consider about uh, seven items plus or minus two at one time. So it's an organizational method. Uh, hierarchies are everywhere. As we said, human organizations, biological organisms. And uh, designing taxonomies. When designing taxonomies on the web, you should remember, but not be bound by the idea that uh, the categories should be mutually exclusive. That means that if you put something in one category, you shouldn't really be putting it in another category. You, but what they're saying here is that you can do that, but that makes your categories weaker. So they use the example of tomatoes. They say tomatoes are really a berry, but many people treat it like a fruit or a vegetable. It could be a vegetable or fruit. Uh, I should have said vegetable or berry, because fruit is a berry. So berry is a subset of a fruit, and then berries are different, or fruits are different from vegetables. And tomatoes are a berry, but many people treat it like a vegetable. So uh, if you had an online grocer and you wanted to put your tomatoes in a database somewhere, people be able to search on them, where do you put them? You can put them in both categories, and then people are more likely to find them. But then, uh, if you put everything in both categories, then the category itself becomes meaningless. So you wouldn't put uh, broccoli in the fruits category. 
Because then the fruit category doesn't mean anything. Does it just mean fruit? It could mean fruit or vegetables. So the point is that you make use of this for grouping information. And then how many, uh, or what, how should you design your site? You have a lot of information. You need to create a website for this. And how do you create it? Uh, it could be shallow and wide, or it could be narrow and deep. If it's shallow and wide, um, uh, if it's uh, too broad and, and shallow, uh, then the, the users are faced with too many options on the main menu, and maybe unpleasantly surprised by the lack of content or once they select the option. So they say, oh, I have so many choices to pick from. I pick this one, and then they say, oh,